So I was also in the hospital three different times for my liver due to too much drinking and too much cocaine because those were my two drug of choice. And one time I was on the critical ward, dying ward, actually, and they told me I didn't even have six months to live. And I said, well, can I get a new liver? And they said, no, you don't have enough time. There's a waiting list of two years. Hello, sweet friends. I'm Stephanie Jacobs, a storyteller and advocate for social justice, and your host of the Love Light Stories podcast, a place where we uncover a deeper understanding of humanity through beautiful, redemptive stories that inspire our hearts. If you long to see more love, empathy, and true connection in our world and your own life, you're in the right place. After spending multiple years studying social justice issues, I've realized the power story has in helping us to understand, empathize, and transform our worldviews into something that's just that, views that are truly worldly. Here in this space, we'll embrace our humanity through raw and authentic stories told by real people themselves. We'll amplify their voices and learn to connect in more meaningful ways. Poverty, human trafficking, incarceration, race, immigration, and more. We'll embrace difficult conversations, sometimes controversial topics, and lighthearted stories too. If you wish to uncover the hope, love, empathy, and connection we can find in our fellow humanity, this is the show for you. So are you ready, lovely? Let's jump in. Well, hello there, lovely. Welcome back to the Love Light Stories podcast, where we create space for real personal stories to be seen, heard, and understood. If you haven't yet, be sure to rate the show, follow, and share it with your family and friends. Today on the podcast, I'm welcoming Pamela Hillman. In this episode, Pamela is sharing her own personal story of experiencing sexual abuse three different times beginning at age five, the addiction to drugs that ensued to numb the pain by age nine, and the 35 years of addiction that ultimately landed her in prison for 18 months in 2010. In this conversation, Pamela reveals what finally broke her addiction and how her life has been redeemed. She helps us better understand those who are incarcerated and the often underlying factors that lead them to prison. Today, Pamela is happily married to her husband, Oz, and is founding president and CEO of Life Changers Legacy, which exists to empower and equip men and women inside prisons, otherwise known as returning citizens, as Pamela would call them, through her mentor-led programs to eliminate recidivism, reduce homelessness, and restore families. I met Pamela in 2018 and have watched as she's passionately grown her mentorship program inside prisons across our country and the world. I've learned a lot from Pamela over the years about incarceration and have even had the chance to visit a prison with her. I'm so excited for you to get a glimpse of that today. As you'll come to see, Pamela has had almost every difficult life experience you could think of, and yet her story has been redeemed for the glory of God. She is living out her calling to reach others like herself so many years ago. She's just simply a gift. Like most of these episodes, this is a difficult story that leads us to the light. But if you have young ones around you, this is a reminder that you might not want them to listen in to this one. And you might not agree with everything discussed here, and that's okay. We're here to understand Pamela's perspective, which stems from lots of life experiences. Her perspective is so valuable in helping us to better understand incarceration, abuse, addiction, her faith, and so much more. Pamela, thank you so much for joining me today on the Love Light Stories podcast. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for the honor of being on here. Yes, we have gotten to know each other over the last couple of years, and I know you have an incredible personal story of redemption and the power of God's love, and um, we want to hear a little bit about that. So could you start just telling us 
about your story, how it began, where you were, all of that. It started at five years old. <laughs> um, so I had a praying grandmother. I'll start with her. And she was constantly instilling Jesus in me and taking me to church. And um, I knew Jesus, but I, you know, you're five. You don't know if you've received him. But um, even though she she was the the anchor to me coming to Christ even later, um, she would look away about things. So she played piano in the church for 65 years, and she would make lunch for, for the pastors. And they came over, and one of them put his hands on me, and he says, this one here is special. She's going to do great things for God one day. I think it was more of an impartation, you know, than it was um, because we're all special. We're all made in his image. So I think it was uh, him just speaking prophetic words into my future. And um, so this this was at five, at um, maybe six. My father, who was in the military, who came back, was an alcoholic. And uh, he, w- he was a good dad up until he got drunk. And one specific day, I brought this little puppy home. It was snowing outside, and I tied it up to the fence. And my mom and my sister were gone. And he's at the door and he says, what are you doing with that dog? And I said, can I have the puppy? Can I have it, please? And he says, come upstairs with me and you can have the puppy. I trusted my dad because he's never tried anything with me. And uh, I just thought we were going up to take a nap. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're laying there and all of a sudden I feel something like a snake and I start crying. And he says, why are you crying? And I ran out of the room. And um, I I could tell you for years, not today, but I could tell you the smell of the room, the the color of the bedspread. I mean, I was so locked into that moment and it created such a trauma in my soul that core belief systems were established that caused me to think, you know, I'm not believed. I am not worthy. I'm not loved. I'm not protected. Um, I'm not worthy of it, right? Mm -hmm. So I later went through life with that, and Satan knows that, right? So he heard this impartation at that time, and he came in to steal that seed. Mm -hmm. I believe it was a seed, and I believe that, you know, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy the seed. And we are God's seed. And when somebody comes and speaks into that seed for growth, then the enemy wants to snatch it. And he does it in childhood. And most people that I've come across now in the ministry, I have found there have been childhood wounds that have not been addressed. The ax has not been laid at the root. And you have to do that. You have to go back to that place of that wound and revisit it. And it's painful. People do not want that pain again. And and I have had to address it. You know, I yeah. wanted, wanted to be free and I'm free today because I went to that place. And, mm-hmm. and it took years. It took years. But when I was young, uh, well, my mom, she left him and uh, divorced my dad. And I really thought it was my fault. And I... I lived with that for years that I didn't have a daddy because I, you know, it was my fault. And so she got with a hippie guy and she worked a lot. She was a very good mom. But one day, uh, my sister, she she's older than I, just 11 months, but she hung out with a lot of older people. And she actually was stealing pot from his glove box and Uh, introduced me to it but then he introduced it to my mom Mm -hmm. and she cried and she you know he he convinced her to actually take a puff and it wasn't so bad after all so this became a family affair we were all smoking pot together and he said if you want something don't go out on the street and get it because you don't know what you're getting uh come to me and so we would go on camping trips and do acid and 
And this is like, you know, 11 years old. And, and it just, I look at an 11 year old today and I think, oh my gosh, who in their right mind could possibly give a child a drug? Yeah. It just, it just blows me away today. But, but God, he, he knew all of this was going to happen and he covered me. I, I listened to this voice and I didn't know it was him at the time, but, um, after they divorced, I just went way out there. I, I was using, uh, cocaine at 13 years old and, started really heavy at 17. But I, this was the amazing thing. I stayed in school and I did so well in school. <laughs> and and I just, I look back at it and I'm like, that had to be God because I looked at so many other people, youth that were using drugs and they were just, well, they were dying left and right. But mm -hmm. that kind of scared me. But as a child, when your mom's boyfriend was offering this to you and introducing it to you did it feel like something that's really foreign and unknown like was it scary or, oh, or were you just super else. trusting because no, you it, trusted him no it took me somewhere else it was mm -hmm. it was like I, that was my relief I knew that I could come out of that bedroom upstairs I was freed inside that's that's what I felt like but it's a counterfeit it's not yeah. true freedom it's the enemy's trap. And you think at that moment that you're 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 feeling no pain. You're not stuck upstairs anymore. But it's a lie. It's all counterfeit from the enemy. And once you get in that cycle, it's so hard to break free. I was addicted for 35 years. My stepdad, that man, who at the time was the boyfriend, um, it turns out that even though he was giving us drugs, he was the only father figure that I ever knew as a real father. I mean, he brought us bikes. He he made sure. I mean, our lifestyle was was bad with, you know, occasional smoking pot and taking us camping and using any kind of drug. But he made sure that we stayed in school he made sure, you know, we had things and he never tried anything with me. Right. That was the main thing because they're, they're just, you know, my uncle, he tried something with my sister and I and just fondling, but still that's traumatic. Yes. And just my godfather after my uh, stepdad, after they divorced, my godfather even tried things with my sister and I. So, you know, it's like, how do you trust men? Right. You're and he was in your safe space, men. mostly. <laughs> I mean, he, uh, he, he, and your stepdad became that safe father figure for you. And yeah. even though he was yeah. offering you substances at a young age, it felt like something you needed to essentially numb things out. It sounds well. I thought it was okay. Yeah, and all, all the kids at school thought it was the most coolest thing that your parents used drugs with you. Mm -hmm. You know, because everybody, not everybody, used drugs, but you know, my little group did, and they were like the most popular and the most best dressed, and you know, but they were still had that other life, and but it's so sad. You're living in this, this void in this sadness that is only temporarily covered it's yeah. it's a just like the covering of adam and eve it was a temporary it wasn't anything that could take that feeling away that that sin away it was just covered just being a young child and going through that trauma and it's I mean your story essentially is such a testament of what that trauma does to you and and how it follows you and and how when you break free what um how much freedom and love you can have to share with others from the Lord it's just incredible 
And and as you grew older, how did you break free from it? Tell us a little bit yeah. about, you know, the middle of your story here. Yeah. I I became a functional addict. I was I worked at the apparel mart for four years. I've worked for realtors, lawyers, and I was functional and you know, party at night with uh, with the lawyers and, you know, it, it just, they knew, well, I don't think they knew that I actually used drugs until later because you can only be functional in it for so long <laughs> because if you have those wounds, it's never enough. You'll never cover it enough because you're always longing for more coverage. And you go deeper into the drugs and then eventually, you know, you quit your job and you, you just don't show up, basically. And to fast forward through a lot of of heartache and a lot of trauma, you know, children are involved. And, you know, I basically told my ex, take care of my children because I, you know, I, I can't. I'm not a fit mother. I didn't feel I was. I didn't do anything in front of them. I just wanted their the best for them. You know, I wanted their life to be successful and not to duplicate me. I didn't want them to be like me. So I love them that much to set them free. But, you know, they were still in my life. But uh, to fast forward through a lot of trauma, I, I've been in the vehicle with so many people who have wrecked head on with a semi truck they fell asleep and I was I was laid back asleep so it the inertia force threw me forward and it uh just my it broke my nose and and uh my back a couple of places and then another time somebody fell asleep at the wheel and it hit the back of a steel utility truck which I went through the windshield that time the buckle didn't catch but I was buckled so anyway, I went out, came back in, and uh, it had sliced my esophagus. My face was just hamburger meat, and it I had uh, two broken vertebra in my back and my tailbone, and I was molded in a body cast in a wheelchair for, for a while, and they said I wouldn't run again because I, I like mm-hmm. to run, and God is amazing. He he has healed me. I had a line that went down the left eye. It was a white line, and my eyelid was white, and I had all these scars up under my chin for a very long time. You can still feel them. They're still uh, visible as well, but God told me to use preparation eight, huh? and I did. I didn't have surgery, and it healed it. You can wow. see some some cuts here and there. But so I was also in the hospital three different times for my liver due to too much drinking and too much cocaine because those were my two drug of choice. And one time I was on the critical ward, dying ward, actually, and they told me I didn't even have six months to live. And I said, well, can I get a new liver? And they said, no, you don't have enough time. There's a waiting list of two years. So I went home and just cried and then, you know, started praying and got healthy, uh, started milk thistle and broccoli and beets and just, you know, doing the right thing until I got with a guy again and that caused me so much pain and that was my trigger. And Satan knew that, and he would always bring uh, a guy, and then something would happen, and and I would uh, go back to drugs. It didn't matter, you know. It's a slow suicide. Those who use drugs, they're they have so much pain inside, and they want to be free. And that's why when if somebody cries out, "I just want to die," "I just want," "I'm going to commit suicide," that is a cry for help. That is a cry. You've got to listen. And you've got to say, look, you know, there's more to life. Let's get you help. Let's get somewhere, uh, get inner healing and deliverance. That's what I I go to because, it, you know, we're in bondage. For our struggle is not 
with flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness and wicked spirits in heavenly places. So we've got to address it from the heavenlies. And we are in that position in Christ. We're now positioned in a place of authority, as Luke ten nineteen states. All power and authority has been given unto us in heaven and on earth. So we've got to position and say, no more, Satan. No more. You're not going to take my life. You've got to get in the word. You've got to get the word in you. Because memorization of scripture will renew your mind and it will heal your body. He has healed me. I'm actually one of 1% of the Americans with 100% health. <laughs> wow. And how how did you, I, I know you've actually told me this before, but how did you come forward with your liver and have, have it healed? Did you get a new one? Yeah. Let me tell you what God did for me. I did not get a new one. No. I, yes, I got a new one from God. Let's put it that way. Okay. I didn't get a new one from man. I got a new one from God. And let me tell you how it happened. It was amazing. So I knew something was going to change. I had a big house and had several vehicles and had just, I had a business that was making a lot of money it was, uh, you, you get into prostitution when you're in drugs. Uh, I don't care who says they don't, it happens. So I was, I had a lot of big businessmen. And anyway, that's a whole nother story. I actually did a segment on 700 Club and I didn't say very much about that part of my life because I don't really talk about it. Um, but they really honed in on that. And that is what that story is about. Oh, wow. <laughs> on the 700 Club. And I just didn't like it. I said, no, you know, that's like my hidden part that I just don't talk about. But it it is something that goes back to when I was taken upstairs. I found that the root was my dad saying, you can have this if you do that. If you go upstairs with me. So that root had to be cut. And so in my big house, I was praying and I was watching TBN. I was watching uh, Sid Roth and every uh, preacher I could on TV as much as I could and hearing the word. Okay. The word is what sets you free. And, and I had a drink next to me. I had a crack pipe next to me and I had the Bible in my lap. And anybody that came in my room, they said, because I helped people even then and would allow people to to live in my home. And when they would come in, how can you be watching that when you're doing that? And I said, if I'm not watching that when I'm doing this, then I'm never going to be free from this. So Mm -hmm. this is the only thing I said, that is the only thing that is going to make me free. And the word of God and hearing the word. I said, so, and I felt it. I felt like something was about to shift. Something was about to happen in my life. And I told them, I said, I don't know what it is, but something is about to happen. And, and I'm ready for it because I was praying. I said, Lord, I said, if you got to put me in an institution, put me in jail, put me somewhere to get me off this drug. I said, I'm, I'm just ready. I'm ready to go be with you. I'm ready to die. I just, I was ready. Yeah, And um, it was two weeks after those prayers, and I was continually praying, but I said, um, no, well, I went to get drugs. It's a whole big story. It's going to be in my book, The Confrontation Within. It's actually See Me Free from The Confrontation Within is my book. Um, but I knew I knew there were cops undercover. I knew the whole scene. I I felt it in my spirit. I told my driver, I said, this isn't right. There's something going on here. He's like, oh, you're just paranoid. No, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. And all of a sudden it happened. And and I had hid drugs in the back of the police car. And when we got to the police station, I went to the bathroom and I was overcome by the Holy Spirit in the bathroom. And I heard this. I mean, it could have been audible. 
I heard in my spirit, I thought you wanted this to be over. Tell them about the drugs in the car. And I started crying and I said, if I do that, I'm going to go to prison because I had been to jail so many times that I, you know, I was violation of probation already. And I would just go to jail for a couple of months and just get a little slap on the wrist. I knew that. But if I told him about the drugs, I would get years. And I knew that. And I was just weeping and weeping. And I went out and I told the officer, I said, I just have to come clean with this. I have to tell you because I don't ever want to go back to the drugs. And I knew if I didn't tell him, I knew I wouldn't be free. I knew I would go back to the drugs. That was my turning point. That was my decision. The Lord allowed me to make that decision. Yes. So I told him about it. And he just, this blood red came over his face. You stupid. Da, 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 da. You're going to go to prison now. And I said, I already know that. I already know that. And um, they wanted to give me 20 years when we went to court. And I got a really good attorney. And he got me five to do three years. And I served 18 months. It was the best 18 months of my life. It wasn't a good experience in there. But it was the change and it was my calling that I discovered. And it was it was just beautiful. He spoke to me in my my room. I never called it a cell because he said, he said, I have brought you here to train and equip you for what I have prepared for you. And I want you to see this with a heavenly perspective. This is your college campus. I said, OK, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so I got all these psychology books and self-help books and recovery books from the library, got them sent in to me as well. And I was just constantly studying and writing. And I had to find out what was causing me to go back to this insidious drug because I, I would be clean for almost two years, uh, three different times of my life. And I got in seminary each time. And I would fall with a man, I would sleep with a guy, and that would cause me so much pain, and I would go back to the drugs. Mm -hmm. So I just said, Lord, don't let me out of here until whatever this is, is gone. I don't trust me. I don't, I, this is my first mission field, because I was giving out scriptures everywhere. Uh, the Lord actually called me to create a Daughters of Zion, Women of God Using Your Time Wisely class in prison. And the women were saying, oh, you don't know what it's like. This happened to me. And you don't know what that's like. This, I did this, I did that. And one person would say this and that. And, and I'm like, oh, I experienced that. Oh my gosh, that happened to me. And so I just said, Lord, I get it. I needed to go through all of these different encounters to be able to relate to each of these different women. And I knew my calling. And they said, how do you pray? Well, the Lord taught me to pray scripture. He says, my word does not return void to me, right? Yeah. So every time that we are praying his word, it's coming back to us. And then he said, put your name in it. So I started putting my name in the word. And if we put our name there, it makes it more personal. And when we speak it out loud, it's, this is something the Lord showed me. If we're speaking negative words, the demons are picking them up and they're causing them to happen. If we're saying positive words, not just positive, but words from his word, the word of God, then the angels are picking them up and they're causing them to be established. It says in Isaiah, excuse me, in Psalms 103, 20, bless the Lord, ye his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, hearkening unto the voice of his word. The voice of his word is me speaking his word. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? Yes. And how do you know for people listening, because I have experienced this as well, where I know God is speaking to me and I can sense things as well, even when I don't 
know specifically. I can still sense his presence. And so for those who are listening who haven't maybe felt that or haven't experienced God speaking to them directly like you have, can you explain that a little bit? Like, is is there words you can use to help them understand what yes. it's like? Okay. Our consciousness is him. Okay. Do we get like, oh, we're we're very aware if we do something wrong. That's your conscious, right? Yes. yes. So so he is present with you always. But are you listening? That's the key. He taught me. He said he told me silent and listen have the same letters in it. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? So sometimes we just have to be quiet. We have to listen and learn his voice. You have to be, okay, if you and I had never talked on the phone, we had never talked in person. You and I used to go to jails and prisons together, actually. Yeah. And we hadn't had that relationship. I wouldn't know your voice. Right. I That's wouldn't have a relationship to know what you sound like. Right. So yes. it's about relationship. It's about discovering him in his word, through his word. He will speak to you through his word also. Let me tell you a quick dream I had. Um, so I usually get up at five, just automatic clock, right? So I go into my day room. My four dogs are in there and and I'm sitting and I have the Bible in my lap. And all of a sudden, the Bible is breathing it's going up and down just like a chest. I want you to envision that now. It's breathing. It is alive. I saw this. And then all of a sudden on the left side of the page, I saw these, these words light up this illuminating gold light. Bright, so bright. And at the bottom of the page, this bright light. And then the next page, at the top of the page, Words were lighting up this gold, illuminating light. The same thing at the bottom of the page. All of a sudden, the words floated up and they made a different sentence. They came together and made a different sentence. And I heard decoding the Bible. And all of a sudden, the day room door opens and my husband walks in. He says, what are you doing? And I said, I'm decoding the Bible. <laughs> and he said, no, do you know what time it is? And I looked and it was 3.33. So the clock actually said three. And my eyes, or the Lord, made it look like it was five so I could have time with him. And he could show me this revelation. It was so beautiful. So being in his word is relationship and listening to him. Asking him, even before you get in the word, Lord, teach me. Give me ears to hear. There's a scripture, Isaiah 50 and 4, that I know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He wakens morning by morning. He wakens my ear to hear as the learned. So pray the scriptures. Apply them to you. Anoint your mouth. Anoint your ears. Say, Lord, I want to hear you. I want to learn you. I want to, I want to, I desire to grow in you. Get hungry for him. And, yes. and just say, Lord, teach me. Give me a teachable spirit. I need to know you more. That's his heart's desire. That is what he wants, a relationship. That's his number one desire. Coming from someone who has been able to establish and build and nurture that relationship with the Lord. And it's so evident into how you speak and, and the way your belief and your faith and in all of it. And for those listening, um, it's possible to get to that point where you do truly feel and know the Lord and he shows up in different ways, whether you just feel his presence or glean something from scripture or from an experience you have in your daily life or whatever it may be and sometimes hear him actually speaking to you and it starts by being present 
in in his sitting in his presence that is that's what i've found as well so i feel like you are saying very similar things to what's been my experience and while i haven't had dreams or some of these more audible things it's very similar so i think yeah um it makes Another a lot of sense that just just blows me away guys is we are filled with the holy spirit of god he lives inside of us do you know how huge that is that that god lives in us that's so amazing to me it's so beautiful and that's another reason that i take care of my temple because he says he will dwell in this temple right this is where he lives oh my gosh do i honor him with what i'm eating Do I honor this temple to take care of it? You know, I mean, it's body, it's flesh, it's, it came from dust, but still he lives in it. It's so beautiful. So he's always present. Excuse me. He's always here, right? We can call on, on him any moment and say, I need comfort right now. Holy spirit. I need peace. I can't deal with this workplace. This atmosphere, bring you, Holy Spirit, your peace into this atmosphere. And he'll do it because he lives in us. We have all the fruit of the Spirit. We have that extravagant love. We have that extreme joy. We have shalom peace. We have his presence. But you got to know it. And you got to know that when you walk into a room, the light is that he is that lives in you is shining in there. It is changing the environment. It's changing the atmosphere because he is present in you and you are there. And I believe divine appointments. I ask for divine appointments all the time because I know he living in me is I'm an extension, right? I'm an extension of him. He is going to illuminate the room, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So essentially, you continued to nurture your relationship with God while you were in prison. And I know a little bit about what happened there, but can you share with everyone else um, how, how you started to grow and emulate his light? Well, when I was studying the... Uh, psychology books and self-help books and and all such, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, the only thing that will change your old mindset is the word of God, memorize a scripture a day. And he gave me Romans 12, 1 and 2. And it says, um, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service, right? So we may not be holy. We may not be excellent or have his, but we do have his. That's the key. We do have his excellence. He's perfect, right? Mm -hmm. So we have his perfection. We can live out in that place if we choose to. We have a dead old nature that will creep up and tell us, you know, oh, that's you. That's who you are. You're still that old person. No, I was crucified with Christ. I no longer live. It is Christ who lives in me. Okay. His resurrection power lives in me. I do not have to be that old person. I do not have to think those old ways. And if it does creep up and I have a bad thought, I can choose at that moment. No. I am not going to receive that thought. I rebuke that in Jesus' name. I renounce you. If I spoke a word that is against the word of God, just something off the wall, I I feel sick. I, I don't ever say that. Even if I'm feeling bad, I don't say I am anything negative. Because when you do, God's nature, the great I am, he says, I am that I am, right? So anything we put after I am, pertaining to our own selves and we're created in the image of God, that becomes an absolute. So if you say, I am sick, 
you better believe you're going to get even sicker because you're taking on the nature of the old Adamic, sinful, satanic nature. And, and that's who brings on sickness and disease is him. So you're saying you're in that old nature. I am. And if you say, I am healed in Jesus name, stand on him, stand on his word, what he says you are. He says in the word of God, okay, that you are healed by his stripes. You are healed. Speak his word, start getting bold and getting confident in who he's called you to be. We are mighty warriors in his kingdom. We're supposed to strap on that full armor of God every single day. And it's up to you. If you're having some bad things happen in your life, sometimes I have discovered that God allows the bad things to bring you through a fire test and it will refine you. It has refined me. The fire is necessary. This is what I do. When I pray, I ask him, Lord, is this of you? I sometimes don't. I don't get an answer because that's my season of fire and testing. But doesn't he say in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, doesn't he say rejoice always? Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. Did I say in everything? Yeah, everything give thanks that's even the bad things and he says for this is the will of god in christ jesus for you it's his will for us to give thanks in every situation so i do that and then i do my part he's given us power and authority for for some reason right so i believe that he has called us to do our part here on earth bind those things they need to be bound. He says in Matthew 16, 18, whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatsoever things you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Doesn't that tell me I got to bind something? <laughs> yeah. And so I'm going to do my part. I'm going to bind. He's given me the power and authority to do so. And then whatever is happening after that, I trust that he's in it. I trust him. I bound the traffic. I was in gridlock traffic, guys. I've never been in this kind of traffic. And people were pulled off the side of the road. They were parked and they were out on the lawn. I've never been in this. I had just come from a bus station to pick up somebody who was coming out of prison. I was there three hours and I finally had to leave. But this is gridlock traffic. And I just had a peace. I've never had a peace in traffic. Believe me. And I said, Lord, I know you're in this. I feel it. And so I got off one exit and it was just everybody had the same thought to get off that exit. So I got back on. And when I got up 400 north, some of you may not know where that is. But anyway, I got on a different highway and it was fairly open. I got a phone call from the guy. And turns out he was at the bus station, but there was a guy that the Lord had pulled up out of his chair at a Starbucks and told him, go to the bus station. Turns out that guy was a pastor. He was led there by the Lord. I picked them both up. The guy was homeless. The pastor was because the Lord called him to a ministry to the homeless and wanted him to encounter being homeless. Mm -hmm. But the Lord said he's bringing him into another season and he had somebody to meet him. And so it was like, I, this is the thing. I got back on the highway. I have never seen traffic loosed like this. I mean, going the opposite direction. There was no cars. There were absolutely no cars. I've never seen no cars on 285. Never. And there were no cars. So I, I laughed and I said, Lord, you were in this entire thing. <laughs> Wow. Did it happen to be rush hour where they were going one direction or no? It, I, there wasn't an accident. We couldn't see anything. It was just stopped. There were, there were, I don't know. I still don't know today. Okay. I, I I do know actually it was the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Because I needed to wait. He wanted me to wait to pick these men up. And, and I did. And they, they, I took them to my center and, and it was, 
I was closing my thrift store, my center, and I needed help. And the Lord brought these two guys at that time. And they've been there for three weeks helping me close the center. (laughs) Wow. So all things work together for good to those who love him. Yes. I love him so much. He is everything in my life. And when we get to a place of surrender, that doesn't mean just surrendering to to him for salvation. That means, is he Lord of your life also? Is he truly everything to you? Is he, if I do this little sin over here, if I tell this little lie, is it going to convict me so much that I, I am weeping before him? It should, because that grieves him and he lives in us. It grieves the Holy Spirit to do things against him, against his will, against what he came to earth and died for. Right. Yes. Okay. And so when you were, I'm going to jump back to your story and then we can get into what you're doing today with your ministry and how that all came to be. So you were in prison and um, the Lord was working through you and share with us how he worked through you to help others in prison and how that led to what you're doing. Okay. So um, I had a great support system when I was in prison. And and I know the Lord established that because there were many times when I would go to jail for a month or three months that I didn't have that support system. And that was detrimental to me when I got out. You know, I, I went back to the old playmates. Mm-hmm. And so this time I had wonderful support system and that was the key. And I'm saying this because... Um, I had letters or cards every day and the women would be, they stand around in this big group and the male is called out. Well, they would walk away crying and I would go over and talk and and try to comfort them. And, and, oh my gosh, so many of them, 10 years they'd been there or five years and they had never gotten a card and it broke my heart. And I said, I, I got their GDC number. I I wrote, I just started collecting all of these and I got different people that I knew on the outside to send them cards. You would not believe the tears. I mean, I'm going to cry right now just remembering it because it brought them so much joy and felt like they belonged. They loved, they were loved. They were, um, thought of they were remembered somebody on the outside knows them knows their name Mm -hmm. and it was so special and so i i you know i was i created this prayer sheet i i asked the lord i said you've heard their cry they've they say they don't know how to pray lord and they need a prayer sheet so he downloaded this prayer sheet it's on my website it's amazing it's anointed completely and uh there's a faith sheet there's an i am sheet and we've got to speak these things out you got to speak them out loud you know the enemy is constantly putting stuff in our ear in our eyes uh, through our gateways okay these are gates and through television radio our phones you know youtube we've got to stop this facebook looking all the time and start looking at his word Start looking at preaching, because if we really want change, choose habits around new growth every day. That's the acronym God gave me for change. Choose habits around new growth every day. If you want change, it can come. So I start this class. The women are coming. I said, you know what? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a workbook and I'm going to come back in. I talked to my when. It was time for me to go. The counselor called me in and and I said, look, can I leave my class? Because I was having a weekly class. And I said, they're they're really getting a lot out of this. And she said, no, no, you can't. You have to, you know, take it with you. And I said, I'm coming back. I'm going to bring this class back. And so I did. Uh, God did. <laughs> I didn't know what to do, how to do it. And he brought the right people. He brought 
I, you know, if you step into your calling and you say, I will, Lord, I, I, you've chosen me, I will step into it. And, but you gotta, you gotta guide my path. This is your ministry, Lord. I dedicate it back to you. Uh, he gave me the name Chabar Ministries. It's derived from Ezekiel 1, 3, uh, 1, 1 to 3. It says, as I was with the captives by the river Chabar, the heavens were open and I saw visions of God. He, he gave me a lot of visions and a lot of dreams and a lot of things I'm not even telling here because it was a lot. So uh, I, that was the name of the ministry for, I guess, the first three years when I got out. Uh, this is very God too. I got out on December, excuse me, on November 18th. My birthday is December 18th and I did 18 months. And I was like, Lord, oh my gosh, 18, 18 is my number now. Cause I didn't know when I was getting out. You, you just never know the date. And, and so I looked up 18. What does it mean? It means new life. Oh, new life. beautiful. I've been given new life. <laughs> Wow. I started I started uh writing the curriculum in 2014 and um I'm now at phase 4 almost completed phase 4 it's called I see me free. You have to see yourself free before you can be free. And they need to see that it has oh my gosh it we offer so many so many tools for this. Uh they need the building blocks, you know. They need they need how to cultivate, excuse me, they need to know how to cultivate new behavior. They need to know that they have dreams that can still be fulfilled. You know, we help set goals. Um, we teach them about acceptance. The first thing is surrender, of course, and then we accept the things that have happened and we discover why they happened. So there's a whole series of phase one, two, three, and four, and it takes you through uh, laminin. That's the glue that holds the body together, and it's in the form of a cross in every single person's DNA that walks the earth. We teach about uh, strongholds. Uh, we have the trauma recovery empowerment model in it. We have uh, stages of change, critical thinking, uh, emotional intelligence. We have criminal thinking, uh, cognitive behavior, uh, internal family systems. I'm trying to remember all that we have in it. <laughs> but it's just, it has all the methodologies of the psychotherapy, but it's combined with biblical specialties. They have to memorize a verse every week, and we encourage them to memorize more. But that is what is required. It's just one a week. And we provide a mentor that walks alongside them. They have a support system, which is vitally important, as I stated earlier. Yes. And, and it's done through email and video visit. You can be a mentor from your home. You don't even have to go into the prisons. And it is so effective. It, let me tell you, we have so many mentors that give their testimony. I think God brought me to this because I needed inner healing. And uh, just so many countless testimonies. It's a two-edged sword. That's what the Holy Spirit said. It's yes. bringing healing to the mentees and the mentors. We don't call them inmates because they are God's chosen people. And God shared me this analogy of of their locked up treasures. You know, what is he, the kings do? They have treasure chest and they, they lock up all their jewels and all these, this gold in there. And how do you refine this, I mean, it has to be in a fire to be refined and to be polished and to get all the rough edges off. And I believe that's what God is doing in the prison system today. Because let me tell you, we have over 700 people that are waiting to get in this program. Men and women, we're in both prisons. We're in all the women's prisons and we're in 10 men's prisons now. And there's 36 men's. But we have, uh, gosh, 1,900 people that are actually in our program. So it, it works. We've got people who have come out. They're in our program, our outpatient program. They're in our, our ministry. They work with us. And it's just beautiful what God is doing. We help. We have an entrepreneurial class. We're actually opening a transition home for men. 
coming out. We're doing the men first because of the the number of men that are actually waiting is is a lot more than the women, and there are more places so that are available. We have so many things available for them. Yes, you do. Every time I talk to you, you have a new program, something different you're trying. And I love, I just love your zest and passion and love to help others continually refining and changing things and all of that. And one of the things I just have to say really quickly that I love so much about your mentoring program and just your whole curriculum in its entirety is the fact that this topic or this this point that you keep touching on that people reoffend because they don't have that support system you found that in your own experience and that's something that i learned you actually sent me to one of the programs to be certified to go into the prisons i think it was yeah in georgia in the state of georgia and so i i did that certification class and in that class, we really dug into the root causes of people offending and reoffending and understanding the psyche and all of that. And one of the things that came down to one of the big points was that the support systems that people have when they come out of prison, they go back to the environment and the relationships that, and not always, but in a classic case of what could happen, and you can correct me, Pamela, but um, what I was learning is that they go back to the same environment and the same relationships that they were in when they first offended. And if nothing has changed in those relationships or environment, it's hard for them to not be tempted to go in back into that lifestyle. And and not just because, you know, they're, they're tempted, but coming out can be really difficult as far as finding work and all of that. And so it gets to this point of, I need money or I need things to survive. And and so there's those temptations. So anyway, having this mentorship and this program makes it so much bigger than just our earthly presence, but living for eternity and understanding God it, in you and all of it, everything that you've shared on this podcast episode already, that is like such a critical key from my perspective. And I love that. So anyway, that was a long way of saying why I think what you do is so important. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Because if we think about it, you know, they they give you $25 when you get out in one outfit. So who could make it even a day without having a support system? And, you know, we are supposed to be discipling. We have been called as a disciple. What did they do? They discipled. They went out to Judea and all the earth, right? (laughs) And all we have to do is just visit them in prison. Matthew states that, right? Matthew 35, 36, 35, verse 26. And so we have to listen to him. He says, did you visit me in prison? And you're like, well, when were you in prison, Jesus? Well, he did, you know, he did get locked up. But did you know that the guy that was next to him on the cross, he was a returning citizen. He was the first one to enter the kingdom of God. A returning citizen was. Yeah. Isn't that That's amazing? powerful. Yes, it sure is. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, the, the bottom bottom line really is, Um, Do we love like Jesus loves? Do we really or do we have a judgment? Are we playing God and judging these people for what they did? Let me tell you, there are some really strong, deep Christians in there that can out church you. Trust that. I mean, they come up with the email and they're they're like, I'm like, wow, you know, I mean, you can feel the flow. It's coming from their heart. It is real. Some of them you can tell, you know, they're just trying to, we we do a $50 package at the end of every workbook course. And you can hear those who are just trying to get the package. And we really hone in on them and do extra with them because we don't want to lose them either. 
even though they're playing games, they might have a spirit of manipulation still. And, you know, we just got to understand the environment that they're in. Yeah. They're in survival mode, 100%. And it's really bad right there now. It really is. I I, I don't know how I would have made it, it at the rate that it is right now in there. It is so bad, guys. There are people coming into rooms, gangs coming into rooms, and they're, the guards aren't even in the dorms. The guards, there might be one guard to three or four dorms. They didn't come back after COVID, and it's so hard to hire them because they don't, you know, just because of what's going on in there. And it's just, it's really bad. And they need our love. They need our support. So many of their family members died during COVID, and they're alone. They're just Mm -hmm. alone. That's sad. I, I didn't realize that, and it makes sense. But they don't have to be alone, right? They have, they have other, yes, yes. They choose to. Yeah, seven over over seven hundred are waiting. Yeah, so how how can someone become a mentor and be part of this program? And how easy is it? I mean, it, it's pretty easy. It's so, easy. yeah. So you get a workbook, they get a workbook. You start at the same time and you walk alongside them. Okay, we ask the mentors go through the workbook too. Do do this too because you don't know what issues you might have to if you've got to do five minutes in the morning 10 minutes 30 minutes reading do it it's for your own good because these are really anointed workbooks and you will know where your mentee is and you can better assist them so you go to the email you introduce yourself on an email and uh, you get a whole packet of your mentee by the way you know their story. You, you Well, you know what the GDC story part is, but you will get their story because number one, uh, phase book, phase one, module one is the power of my story. So we ask them to write their story and to put an emotion next to every section of their story because they're going to rewrite their story in phase four and it's going to be a different perspective. It's going to be different. All the healing has has taken place. Some of it, not all, maybe, but enough to see the difference, to see the measurable outcome. We do that. We've got questions throughout the workbooks, but it takes you maybe 30 minutes a week to do emails. You do one email a week is the requirement. We ask you to get on their visitation list unless you are a pastor or chaplain and you go into the prisons uh, to minister to the groups then we we don't ask you to actually do the visitation because then you can't go into the groups and it is better to reach more so we do ask you to get on the visitation list of your mentee so you can do video visits you can do a video just like a zoom meeting it's really not like a zoom meeting it's it's less quality but (laughs) <laughs> your mentee. You get to see them. You get to hear them. You get to hear their memory verse. And you get that connection. You get that relationship building and support system that they need. You know, we, we do so many things for them. We'll contact the parole board and see what their status is. We've even gone on Facebook and pulled pictures of somebody's children and sent them to them. You know, we have to make sure that particular person isn't uh, in there for any kind of child harming or anything like that. But there are rules. We have a training. It's an hour and 30 minute training. It's online. It's a Zoom meeting and it's easy. It's just so easy. Yes. And so, so anyone can do now. this from any part of the country, right? Because it's right. all online. Yes. The visits, yeah, everything. All over the world. Mentor. Yeah. Yeah. All over the yeah. world. Jamaica, Australia, the UK. We have mentors all over the world who are mentoring. Incredible. Incredible. How about, is there any other places um, that you'd like to direct people to? How can people find you? Yeah. Lifechangerslegacy.org. We do have two websites, and we actually just recently had this one built, and it's lifechangerslegacy.net. And just 
take a peek at it. <laughs> I kind of like it. It's a virtual um, room, basically, and it's pretty cool. It's updated iDeg stuff. But go to lifechangerslegacy.org to sign up. Uh, go to the mentor page on the tab, and there's a drop down mentor sign up. You can pull those. Just download all those forms, fill those out, scan them back to the person that is on that form. And that would be diana.a at lifechangerslegacy.org. Okay. Well, thank you, Pamela. It has been such a wonderful conversation. Um, Really appreciate you sharing your story with us and just being able to have a deeper understanding of what God can do inside of the prisons and all of that. So again, thank you. Yes. Thank you for the opportunity here. Thank you. This has been an honor. Well, that was a heavy discussion, wasn't it? And she really has walked through so much, hasn't she? Pamela shared so much of her story, and I really appreciate and honor her vulnerability so that we can come together to better understand those who are walking through similar experiences. One of the things that stood out to me was how her childhood wounds led to decades of pain, addiction, and trouble. It's so easy to see how trauma in childhood creates for a very difficult life. What else stood out to you? I also thought it was so neat that she said the 18 months she was in prison were the best 18 months of her life. It was tough, but full of life-giving transformation with the Lord. This is truly a story of redemption, and it's so beautiful. As Pamela mentioned, it's easy to become a mentor from your own home. Just go to lifechangerslegacy.org and click on the Mentorship Program tab. Are you thinking about possibly sharing your own story one day? You can snag my first time storytelling checklist to share your own story with confidence and no regrets. This checklist walks you through a list of questions you should consider when deciding whether you're ready to tell your story for the first time. You can snag my first time storytelling checklist to share your own story with confidence and no regrets on my website at stephaniemjacobs.com slash resources. Did this episode touch your heart? If you love today's story and have a relatable experience to share, encouraging words for our guests, or just want to share a comment, go to the show notes for this episode and send us what we like to call heart mail for a chance to have your note featured on an upcoming episode. If there's a large response to any particular story, we might just bring that guest back on the show to dive into your comments or even have them join us as a guest in the Love Light Stories Facebook community. It's as easy as sending us a voice message or written note, both easily accessible in today's show notes. Simply go to stephaniemjacobs.com and click on the Stories tab. So give it a try. Send us your heart mail. I just can't wait to hear what's on your heart. And hey, thank you so much for listening to this podcast and leaning into today's story. And don't forget, you can subscribe to the show wherever you listen to your podcast so you don't ever miss an episode. And a great way you can support these conversations is to rate the show and leave a review. And if you have a friend who would like these stories, share it with them too. All of these things are the best way you can support this podcast. So thank you. And until next time, lovelies, keep radiating that love and light to everyone you meet.